So thank you for joining us again. Uh, probably my first question to you, Ada. What did you learn from Bob's speech? <laughs> well, I learned a lot, and, and what I was mainly thinking about was these issues about how do the internal economic and social dynamics which I was talking about relate to the international relations issues, which is Bob's areas of expertise. And I, I do think it's very important to link those two. So sometimes there's a school in international relations that says, I don't need to pay any attention right. to that stuff. It's all just a sort of game of diplomacy, etc. And sometimes you know, economics is detached from thinking about those geopolitical implications. But I think, I think they are linked. And I think I would say a reason to be optimistic and then a reason that makes me worried. So th thinking about you know, Europe, and whether there's any possibility that Europe could revert to the 1930s, etc. I think you do have to realize the underlying sociological and economic drivers of what leads to the 1930s, both in terms of Nazism and in terms of communism. And it is a huge disruption. I mean, basically, the 19th century is a massive disruption of settled agricultural life, uh, existing structures of society, people move into big cities, uh, they have different relationships. And what is interesting is that in some societies, there are also political reactions to that, which create ideas of imperialism or Lebensraum, partly to deal with you know, excess numbers of young people whom you can't be sure are going to support the established political order. So if you look at Germany, I, I do think the origins of uh, the rise of Nazism, you do have to look back into the Bismarckian Empire and the quite overt way in which existing industrial and landed elites then are creating a militarism as a way of containing a working class and turning it away from communism, but having created that militarism, you know, it, it's got a whole set of values uh, on which Hitler can build. I mean, you know, the, um, the German army militarism was not created by, by Hitler. It, it was there for him to use in a more radical uh, and, and dramatic fashion. The other thing to say is that, uh, you know, I've always thought, look at the, demo the demographics. 19th century demographics are are really quite dramatic in terms of the growth of population. Population of UK goes from about 10 million to 40 million during the course of the century. Uh, but the UK is actually able to send off a, a non-trivial element of that to be settlers in Australia, New Zealand, uh, Canada, uh, the US. Uh, Germany has a huge population explosion from 1870 to 1940. So when Hitler talks about Lebensraum, there's, there's, you know, there's something beneath that, a, 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 a feeling that the population needs a place to go. Now, none of that is there now. You know, British, Europeans are not taught military values uh, in the same way that they were in 1910 or 1920 or 1930. The entire British public school system, let alone the sort of Juncker aristocracy, was, was taught people one of the best things to be in life. Your value was to be a soldier. It was good to, good to die for your country. We're not taught that any longer. So all that is, that makes me feel good. On the other hand, the thing that worries me is I do think that the peaceful era of the 50s, 60s, 70s, which you have explained, I think, rightly in a set of contingent structures into international relations, was also underpinned by a particular conjuncture in the economy. I think the nature of technology, the nature of demographic growth, the nature of relatively little immigration from outside either the US or outside Europe, though there were significant movements within Europe, was particularly conducive to the working class doing well. Mm -hmm. It helped to create an environment where ordinary working, skilled workers in the factories of Chicago or you know, Stuttgart did very well and therefore were very willing to support the ex existing uh, political structures. And I think that is breaking down right. to a degree. And the other thing which is breaking down 
is the demography and migration. I mean, the biggest challenge, I think, to the European political order, the, the, the common feature across the populists is migration. It is immigration. Uh, that was crucial to Brexit. Bre the vote would not have been won by the Brexiters but for those million people who moved into Germany in 2015. Now, you can say, well, why does a million people moving into Germany in 2015 affect the vote in Britain? But it does, because it makes it so easy for people to tell a story. That's what's happened in Germany. It's going to happen to you. And the demography of Africa relative to Europe, I think, is going to put huge stress on our system. So I think the peaceful international relations order, which was underpinned by these contingent institutional relationships and behaviors was also underpinned sure. by a particular social and economic and, uh, and employment conjuncture, which was favorable to making it easy for, as it were, the elites to get on with that you know, right. uh, uh, international order unchallenged by people saying, but I'm not doing very well out of this system. Right, right. Yeah, I think you opened a very big question. We cannot deepen uh, here, but it's, it's really a big question. On one side, you have birthing nations, and on the other side, you have aging nations. And I think this divide will only grow over the next yeah. years, and this, I think, you correctly said, will be uh, one of the key challenges. When you look at, you correctly also said, what happened in the late 19th century, early 20th century, when you had six or seven kids per family, you can easily send them to war. But when you have zero kid, one kid, two kid, the willingness to go to war declines. Bob, what did you learn from his speech? Well, as I said, I'm trying to process all of it. I mean, I, I, you know, it's interesting what you say is so true. And, you know, the, I've always said about in the United States context, the 1920 election and the 2016 election are very similar. And they are driven in part by exactly what you said, which was in, the, in, the in 1920 or in that, in that period, you were also having in the United States a tremendous dislocation and rejiggering re of the economy as people moved off the farm and into the sort of more industrial urban life. And this was very unsettling to people, in addition to which you'd had 20 years of the greatest period of immigration yep. in American history up to that point. Um, and so between the two of those, yep. you actually had a very radical revolution in 1920 in the sense that it was a protest against progressivism, against immigration, and against what was happening to people's lives. The only difference being you got Warren Harding out of it, yep. <laughs> you know? And so we look back and it seems boring even to talk about the 1920 election. So a lot of it has to do with, you know, it has to do with individuals and what, and what issue uh, gets described. But I mean, to me, the interesting thing that uh, you were quoting uh, uh, Cohen is this idea that when people lose all their jobs, uh, they're all gonna be so happy. Yeah. Uh, not, you know, when, yep. they, when, they, when, this, uh, when this robotization uh, of, uh, of society occurs, people are gonna be perfectly content with that. And I, can, I believe that that could well be the case. And the only, for me, the only problem is, you know, this is always the, this is always the struggle. Are, are, do nations behave according to rational economic judgments or any kind of rational judgments, or do they behave according to emotional judgments uh, or, or you know, fears and angers that are part of their own uh, creation? And unfortunately, the answer is they often, uh, you know, I could make a case that for the Chinese, for instance, there is no economic sense to them ever becoming very aggressive. Yep. They can become as rich as they want for as long as they want. Um, and you know, and it's sort of like the scorpion and the frog yep. uh, tale. Um, and the scorpion, you know, bites the frog halfway across the leg, and, the, and he says, "Why?" He says, "Because I'm a scorpion." And you know, rising powers are rising powers, and they behave in a certain predictable pattern. And, and fending that off is difficult. But I'm not smart enough to know what the implications of what you say are for geopolitics at the moment. I have to admit. <laughs> I guess no one really knows. And uh, coming back to you. Um, picking up the topic of uh, who the winners are, go uh, are going to be. My question would be, what do you think? What are they going to do? Will they still support the welfare state? Or do they just retreat in the gated communities? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a very interesting issue. Um, because if Tyler Cohen's right, 
It isn't that his poor people in the trailer parks are necessarily yeah, happy people. in some meaningful They're not revolutionary. They're just not revolutionary. Right. They may all be on opioids. I mean, you know, no. I mean, they may be, no. you know, pretty depressed uh, people committing suicide. I mean, you know, the... the, the opium is the opiate of the people. Yeah, opium is the opium <laughs> of the people, yeah. Um, so, uh, the... But what do the elites do? I mean, it is very interesting. There, there is a... Uh, I think there's a sub group within Silicon Valley uh, who, who almost do, have got a sort of Nietzschean idea of themselves as supermen or superwomen because they're so clever, who have a sort of right to, you know, create uh, everything, uh, uh, all this great cornucopia of uh, 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 technology, and sort of don't quite see the purpose of all the other people. Uh, uh, the, the nicer ones among them, uh, I think, reach for, well, okay, if only we had a universal basic income of $15,000, just give it to them, and the whole, the whole problem's over. But there, also, there is also a subset of technologists which are into a sort of hyper-individualism. I mean, yeah. there has always been, within the culture of, of, of Silicon Valley, a, w w something which on the one side leads to a sort of slightly, you know, progressivism, environmentalism side, but there is also a, a hyper-individuality side uh, as well. Uh, I think that's quite dangerous in terms of the society uh, which we will create. Just to turn to one other issue that, that was raised, I think we just don't know what's going to happen with China. At one level, you know, the classic, there's all this stuff about rising powers and everybody does the, you know, Germany, um, et cetera, and then they go Sparta and Athens, et cetera. I don't, but I, I, I know you don't, but it, you sort of, you sort of compete, right, right, right. compete with one another for right. how many uh, deeper historical analogies <laughs> you go. I mean, there could be an argument that China, I mean, China's overtly stated ideology is peaceful rise. It's sort of a classic piece of uh, Chinese uh, foreign policy statement, peaceful rise of China. It may not be impossible. I mean, China does not have in its history a deeply irredentist tendency beyond what it perceives as being China. Let's be clear, it thinks Taiwan is part of China, it thinks Tibet is part of China, it thinks the South China Sea is part of China, even though that claim is based upon the most absurd nine-dash line, which is a sort of, you know, a map just created for no particular reason. Um, but I do not think that there is a Chinese aim to, you know, invade the rest of the world, nor do I believe that China is in the grip of an ideology which feels the need to, you know, persuade the rest of the world uh, to you know, assume it in the same way that the Soviet Union was. And of course, the Chinese demography is going to turn down sure. and China is going to be a, an aging society with a falling population. It may already have started falling already, some demographers believe, but certainly it'll start falling by 2025. And by 2025, it'll be a population uh, probably 10% lower than below and very old. And on the whole, older people don't tend to form themselves into armies and attack, <laughs> attack the guys next door. It's not a classic sort of 70-year-old behavior. So there may be some things that should make us a bit more, you know, less certain that China... I think what China will do is there is a deep sense in, in China that they are the middle kingdom and that they're almost entitled not to a formal geographic empire, but almost a sort of informal empire. The Chinese empire at its height was not something that invaded and occupied other people, but it did, it did like tribute from them. It did like deference from them. And there is an element, I think, within the Belt and Road Initiative, which has elements of that old Chinese approach. But I don't know what you think on that, Bob. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you don't have to demonize the Chinese to, to see where the problems can come from, even if they just behaved normally. And, and I think that's what I tend to look at. So. By the way, they wouldn't be, they aren't the first power to say, wait a second, the Americans got a Monroe Doctrine, why don't we get a Monroe yep. Doctrine? Yep. The Japanese also said that uh, in the early 20th century and certainly felt it. Yep. And every country that's a great power, the mark of a great power is you have a sphere of influence. Now, the problem with China, in addition to what the implications of invading Taiwan would be, yep. is that Japan doesn't want to play in that game. Yep. And so it, the problem, in a way, isn't even the United States. The problem is, what is Japan's response to China's desire to exercise hegemony? 
And I think Japan's response is predictable. It will grow more nationalistic, more militaristic, it will go nuclear. You know, if it feels that the United States is not providing protection and China is, is trying to win back just its old position, Japan will respond. India will respond. Korea will respond. So my concern is not, this doesn't, what happens in East Asia is that it's not like the Americans pull quietly out and the Chinese pull quietly in. What happens is, basically East Asia becomes what Europe was in 1900. And that, again, you don't have to blame the Chinese for it, you might wind up blaming the Japanese for it. But that is, that is the dynamic that we have prevented up until now, which I think is certain to return in that circumstance. And again, as I say, you don't have to demonize the Chinese uh, in order to foresee that scenario. And then the other thing you don't have to demonize them for, but it's still a problem, and the Belt and Road reflects this, is that like any great rising power, um, they want to be able, as much as they possibly can, to secure their lines of communication to resources in the event of a conflict. And that means building a bigger and bigger navy, it means buying ports, it means building a structure across the land, et cetera, et cetera. Every power that has the capacity to be self-reliant wants to be self-reliant. Up until now, they've been living in a world in which if the United, they depend on the United States to keep their sea lines of communication open. If they go to a war with the United States, immediately those sea lines of communication are cut. They want to get out of that situation. Unfortunately, getting out of that situation leads to multipolar competition, et cetera, and then you're back to the old formula. So those are, that's more my concern than China conquering the yep. world. Yeah, just to add a, a little bit on that, how fast do you think, Bob, it can go until the political landscape derails completely, looking back at history? Well, when uh, you look at the pace we see today, it's already high paced. Unfortunately, that's again, I think, in addition to not realizing how bad things can get, people don't realize how quickly things can go bad. Um, I, I quote a line, one of my favorite lines from the Ernest Hemingway's uh, novel, The Sun Also Rises, uh, someone who went bankrupt is asked, how did you go bankrupt? And his answer is, <laughs> gradually and then suddenly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that's what we know from retail. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and unfortunately, I think if you look at world orders in the past, that is what happens. You can see things fraying away, and then all of a sudden the bottom falls out. Um, and I do worry that things can happen very quickly. Yeah. I, th I think uh, it's important here if we, if we shift away from the international relations back to sort of the social behavior uh, at a sort of more micro level, to think about how people's attitudes can change in both what I would consider favorable and unfavorable directions. I think, for instance, within my lifetime, the, I would say we've become, in Western Europe, much pleasanter people on things like gay rights, etc., And you have extraordinary transformations of society. I mean, if you look at Ireland, which in 1960 was a deeply Catholic conservative society, essentially dominated by a theocratic state. I mean, with the Catholic church embedded in a way which was not seen elsewhere in Europe. And, you know, uh, people, you know, just had a set of certain attitudes to sexuality, to gender, to uh, homosexuality, which are now you get Ireland passing, you know, referenda by 70 for 30 uh, on those issues. Now, whether you agree or not with that direction of change, things change very, rapid. very yeah. rapidly. Um, but we also know that they can change in ways that I would consider unfavorable. And I think what we're beginning to realize is that the internet can play a role in this as well. Um, I think, you know, the way that people behave is determined in part by what they think is acceptable behavior. And within any society at any one time, you've got some people who have some pretty aggressive points of view on a racial basis or a sexual basis towards other people, but if, you know, the dominant point of view of society is that that is not the right thing to say or the polite thing to say, then it gets said by, you know, two drunk people, you know, in the, the bar late at night, but because nobody else hears it, it doesn't get magnified. I think the role of the internet of legitimating points of view, which once they get legitimated on the internet,
then build and build is something we really don't understand. But for instance, we know in Britain that the, the tenor of our public debate is getting coarser and, at least in verbal terms, more violent than it's ever been. In particular, we have this extraordinary phenomenon of incredibly aggressive attacks on women politicians, uh, in particular, more than anything else, with people saying on the internet things that they would never have said in a public meeting, but it is, it is used to shift, and it's almost deliberately used by bits of the alt-right, I think, to move the barriers of what is acceptable mm. in a way that then can change uh, general attitudes. I mean, we have highly malleable brains. Uh, uh, we have beliefs which reflect what we were taught at school. We have beliefs which reflect w what we heard. And so I think there is a major issue if we want to preserve liberal, broadly liberal, or broadly democratic, or broadly values that believe in a, a, an ordered and respectful way of debating political issues, we need to have, think about how to preserve those values. That They need to be preserved consciously in the same way that the international order needs to be preserved consciously. That, that is another garden right, right. that has to be tended, because if you don't tend that garden, you'll find things, you'll suddenly find that points of view are legitimated, uh, which will shock us. It's, it's great when you have great guys around, surrounding you, you they just talk. Yeah. It's wonderful, <laughs> it's wonderful. And what they say normally is very intelligent. <laughs> That's the other one. But, but you're right, uh, when I just pick up your, your, uh, your example, I think Twitter, is an excellent yep. object to study where you see that I follow quite interesting people, mm -hmm. people who are nearly Nobel laureates. Yep. What they tell you on Twitter yeah. is unacceptable. Yeah. So they, they say words yeah. you wouldn't say otherwise, yeah. even among friends. Right. So uh, the, the, the social dynamics is, uh, is interesting and it can happen very quickly. Before I open to the, to the public, I would ask you one question that worries me when I look to Switzerland, the skills issue. Mm -hmm. Skills won't help because Switzerland is basically a middle-class society. We always hope that better education, yep. re-education will help to stay a strong middle-class society. And all the, the, the jobs that are well-paid in Switzerland, like in healthcare, like in education, uh, and, and also in administration, will help us to prevent any kind of populism and yep. derailing towards uh, the extremes. Well, look, I said Skills won't solve the problem in the sense that skills won't be sufficient. But it's better to have high skills than low skills. Um, you know, I, I'm passionately, I mean, there's a, I'm absolutely passionately in favor of people being well educated, well educated as citizens uh, as much as, as workers. I think it's very important that we don't turn the idea of education as something which is important instrumentally because it will increase competitiveness and, and productivity. I think that's an incredibly narrow-minded point of view of education. We should be educating people because only by, because educated people will be good citizens of a democratic society. We should be educating people to have lots of opportunities um, to express themselves in a world where we could have more leisure if we want in order to find uh, useful things to do. The one thing that I'm not sure is that education in itself will be a solution to the problem <coughs> of rising inequality. Because I still think, however well people are educated, if we have worked out how to basically run retail stores with almost no one in them, insurance companies where all the back off office processing is done by a computer and has to employ almost no one, manufacturing with uh, robots and very few people uh, in them. If you say to people, you'll be okay as long as you've worked out how to code or write computer games or you know, be you know, something else, you'll find that they don't have employment. Let me give you an example, playing a musical instrument. I would love as many people as possible to learn to play and love playing a musical instrument. It will make, if however, everybody could play a great musical instrument, the number of people who get their living from being great violinists 
will is unlikely to increase, and the pay of the third best you know, violinist in town uh, will not increase because in a world where you know, uh, we have communications and streamed music, um, all the value goes to the highest quality people. So you, you get these wonderful artistic things, you know, all forms of artistry have extraordinary uh, pyramids of, of pay today, which they didn't used to. Uh, there's a wonderful article uh, in economic theory called The Economics of Stardom, uh, written a, a long time ago by a man called Stuart Rosen, uh, which pointed out uh, that essentially uh, the emergence of radio and television meant that far fewer people had their income derived from playing a musical instrument because everybody could listen to the best musician in the world. So yes, we should educate people, but don't fool ourselves that it is a sufficient challenge to the likely problem of increasing inequality of income in the labor market. Just one final optimistic outlook. I ask both of you, what do you think is Europe's most precious asset right now? Lord Turner. Wow. <laughs> You want to make the American answer first? <laughs> um, I think it's actually, perhaps, many young people, people of the age of my daughters and my nieces, who do actually feel partly European as well as partly national. And the extent of that belief, which I think is disparaged by the nationalist politicians and underestimated, gives me a bit of hope for the future. Thank you. Well, I, I'll, I'll answer as from an American point of view, which is that Europe's greatest gift to the world has been a Europe at peace. Yeah. And the fact that I think we are a long way, I like to think a fairly long way from the possibility of imagining uh, Europe returning to the kind of conflictual international situation that existed before World War II. And that as long as that is true, uh, that's kind of why I focused on this today. As long as that is true, then what I consider to be the worst thing that can possibly happen in the world is not going to happen. Thank you very much. I think that's a very fine note. We are hungry, we are thirsty, but please, first of all, before we all go downstairs, continue our discussion. A warm applause to our two speakers. Thank you.